Put that down real quick. Well, welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. Good to see you all. We are, we are back to our regularly scheduled program here in the book of Peter, and hopefully we'll get through it if, if I'm attentive, and I will do my best to do that. How's everybody doing? It was 42 degrees this morning when I woke up. What in the world is that about? It's like fall. It's all right. That's why I have, I have the long sleeves. So we're, we're well protected from the weather. Well, previously at Grace, we were going through the book of 1 Peter, and we got through chapter 4, where Peter is exhorting us to suffer well, to be able to go through some of the difficulties we go through, to see through the obvious discomfort and the pain and the emotion and all of that to something ultimately that God is doing in our lives through that difficulty. And uh, having that wisdom is one of those things that will help you to hold on to the Lord, even when things are difficult and hard. And uh, I don't know about you, but I, I need to remember that in those times. It's easy when you're sitting here and you're reading the Bible or, or hearing a sermon. That's another thing when you actually have to put it into practice when you're going through pain, when you're going through suffering and difficulty, to be able to really lean on the Lord. And we saw that uh, Peter gave us a bunch of information in chapter 4. One of the ones that sticks out to me is verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator. So that's kind of a good rule of thumb for me. That would be a good tattoo, you know, or a bumper sticker or something. To remember that when we're suffering for Christ, when we're doing the right thing, and we're still under under the knife or under the pressure, that it's it's good for us and it brings glory to God as long as we hold fast to him. And we have to just trust him in those things. Amen? Because we will go through some things. This week, you've noticed I've t toned down the recap of last week. This week, we're going to go into chapter 5, the last chapter. I've titled it, Submit and Resist, because he gives us those two exhortations here. First Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. How many of you know that to be a fact? Yeah. In fact, if you decide that you want to serve the Lord with your whole life, you're going to notice that uh, your world comes up against you, your own heart, your education, your background, your own predisposition is against you. And of course, we know where it comes from, which is the, the author of all those things, which is the devil. And so we're told to resist him steadfastly in the faith. So we're, we'll talk about that today. Basically, he's going to have three sections here, and I have it parsed out for you. He's going to talk about being humble, being watchful, and being hopeful. So those three things. So you'll, you'll watch as we, go three, uh, as we go through these three that it's separated just like that. Before we get into it, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you that we have an opportunity to meet, even on a cold day, to come into a warm place, to center our minds and our hearts on you. That we can worship you in song, we can worship you in fellowship with one another who you have done a work in each one of our lives. And Lord, we can remember the sacrifice that you made for us at Calvary, that which purchased us back from the sin in which we would otherwise have to pay for with eternity being separated from you. Lord, we thank you for all of these blessings. We thank you for your word being preserved we thank you for this fellowship and this time. Lord, we need your spirit. We need your spirit to activate and speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, to be submitted. Help us to be on guard, to be watchful, and that we might receive from you this morning, that you might make us more into the image of your son. So it's Lord with our hearts we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beginning in verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, 
not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So we're given this little exhortation. It's really to the elders. So I'm going to talk to the three other men in this room who are elders. <laughs> We've seen previously, he talks about masters, to servants, to wives. He's giving exhortations to various groups. And he's finally come in chapter five to the elders. And so he tells them, elders, I'm exhorting you. And this is the be humble part of the scripture. The elders who are among you, I exhort. The elders, actually, the word is presbyteros. If you, if you like learning languages at church, um, presbyteros means olders. So whenever you see elders in this particular context, it means those with gray hair. Even if you have no hair, you qualify. So he's talking to those who are older. Uh, so he's talking about the quality of the age of those who would be leaders in the church. Uh, so you and I would understand that there are two bodies within the church that uh, the scriptures have, which is the body of deacons, which take care of the physical needs of the church, and the elders, which oversee the spiritual direction of the church. So those are the two in the scriptures and how it's all put together. Here, he's using the word elders where if he's, if he's not using the presbyteros word, then I'll let you know because there's another one called episkopos and they're somewhat synonymous. An episkopos is one who is an overseer, one who is uh, given managerial, if you will, oversight in the church. So here he's speaking to those who are the olders, the gray headed ones, and he's exhorting. I find this amazing that Peter, who's an apostle, okay, and he's an older man by this time, he could say, listen, I'm an apostle and you guys better listen up. I'm going to tell you some things you better be obedient to. And he doesn't do that. He says, I'm exhorting you. What he's doing is he's kind of coming alongside them and saying, hey, do this, will you please? And I appreciate the posture by which he's delivering this message, don't you? I find it so much easier if somebody kind of comes alongside and encourages me rather than points their finger at me and browbeats me into you better do this and you better do that. It's, it's good parenting too, you know, you, you know, you, you catch your son, you know, woofing down all this Halloween candy, you know, and <laughs> you say, do you think that's a good idea? I mean, are you close enough to the bathroom? So when that <laughs> reflex takes in that you'll be, you'll be able to make it. I want you to consider this just for a moment. And that's the kind of spirit that Peter, the apostle, who was considered kind of the spokesperson for all 12 of them when Jesus was on the earth, that's how he entreats people. And I just think it's so respectful the way he does this. He could demand people, but he doesn't. He comes beside them and it's parakaleo, which is to, uh, it's the same word that we get paraclete, which is the word for the Holy Spirit. The one who kind of comes alongside to counsel. And he says, I am a fellow elder. He's not talking to them as one who has authority over. He's talking to them as one who is even. He's not speaking ex cathedra. He's not saying, I am the Pope of the church. He's not saying any of those things. He's saying, I'm in the same boat as you. And boy, isn't that good when someone comes up and they explain that they have a common placement before the, the throne of God as you do. And it's even when you respect them and even when they have authority, it's a really good way to be able to go about it. And I just thought I'd share that little point with you. And he says, I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He says, I'm, I'm in it. I'm, I'm in the family with you guys. I'm one of your brothers. And I was there and I saw Jesus suffer in the garden. I saw him when he prayed and he was sweating, as it were, drops of blood. And he said, Father, can this, you know, can this cup pass from me? But not my will, your will be done. And he saw this agony that Jesus went through between his humanity and his deity. And he says, I was an eyewitness to these things. So, you, you know, if somebody's an eyewitness to something, you can trust them, right? And especially if there's a whole bunch of eyewitnesses and they all have the same report. You can trust that. 
if they were third person or, you know, thousands of years later, I would question that. But that isn't the case here. He says, I was there. And, of course, he fell asleep three times, and Jesus had to come and wake him up. But that happens, right? He was also there on the mountain, that glory that will be revealed. He got a little peek of when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. And suddenly Jesus, they woke up, they were sleeping again. It happens all the time, apparently. So Peter, James, and John are up there, and they kind of wake from their sleep, and they see Jesus having kind of a conference with Moses and Elijah. And, you know, Peter's overwhelmed, and of course he has to say something, because who says nothing when that happens? Probably wise people. But Peter then sticks his foot in his mouth, and he says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's build three booths, and we could just stay here. Like, we're not going to camp out here, Peter. And God the Father shows up in a cloud and he says, this is my son. Listen to him. Peter interrupts a meeting and then God has to interrupt him and say, hey. He's so kind though, isn't he? He could hit us with lightning, but he doesn't. And he says, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. Well, this is, a, this is a pretty interesting thing. A shepherd is something that Jesus is identified as in the scripture. In fact, 1 Peter 2, 24 to 25, who himself bore our sins on his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Notice that passage uses both terms synonymously with Jesus as our shepherd, and he's the, he's the chief shepherd and the chief overseer. Amen? Amen? All right. Jesus is identified as the chief shepherd and overseer. And so Peter's giving us who are sub-shepherds or, uh, you know, um, under-shepherds to giving us information about how to follow Jesus as a shepherd. Well, Jesus is our great example. He says here in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. By the way, that is the sign of a good shepherd. Somebody that sacrifices their life for the sheep. Amen. Amen? But a hireling, he who is not a shepherd, one who does not have his own sheep, seeks, sees a wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and he doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my own. I want you to notice a good shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know him. Because we live in a world that is so convenient to flick on the TV and watch any preacher on TV and then say, I went to church. It's very easy to become a professional speaker with, you know, a couple of sermons in my pocket that I give everywhere I go. It's a much more difficult thing to get to know people because then you get to see the mess. You didn't realize that? Because that's what Jesus does. Look, what, look how he changed the world. He took 12 disciples and one of them was destined for not so greatness and changed the entire world because he had a relationship with 12. That's the way the Bible rolls it out. That's the way it happens. And that's the way it's supposed to be in church. So if you think I'm a professional speaker, first of all, you haven't heard enough. <laughs> Secondly... Being a pastor, being an elder, means developing relationships with the people in the church. Them knowing you and you knowing them. And that sometimes includes the warts and all, people. Do you know what I'm talking about? It means about being honest about your life and disclosive. And the beautiful thing about that sort of transparency is God begins to work in that situation. Because sin is one of those things that's like mushrooms. It grows in secret. And when it's disclosed and it's brought out, then suddenly everything starts to happen. So there's accountability. So Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by my own. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So we see a couple of characteristics, elders, of what elders do in the church. You lay your life down for the sheep. 
that requires time. It requires money. Sometimes you're crawling in dirt. It requires all sorts of things. Uh, only a few of you know what in the world I'm talking about. It requires giving your life for the sheep, and that's a big calling. Myself and three other elders have this place, and I hope you sense that we love you Amen. and want to know you, and hopefully you know us. It's not like, oh, there's that guy who speaks on Sunday. I saw him on TV, and he goes away. Or, I, you know, I have an entourage who surround me and make sure that I don't have to talk to anyone <laughs> or anyone weird, which is most people, honestly. And, you know, I'm going to jump in my limo and scoot off, and you won't see me until next Sunday. There are people who believe that's what a pastor is. I just think they have too much TV. So... A good shepherd sacrifices his life, he doesn't run away, and he knows the sheep, and they know him. Those are all characteristics. As he's encouraging the elders, I think we should know that. Peter is telling us about being a shepherd, and it's interesting because Jesus, in John 21, restored him by saying some things. He said, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? By the way, the disciples were there, and there was a bunch of fish that they just caught miraculously. It's a question as to which one he was referring to. Do you love me more than these fish? <laughs> or do you love me more than these other disciples? I see both of them could be the case. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? It seems a little formal. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. I, I get the idea, Lord. And he said the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, without going into the original language and all of the depth of that, the simple thing Jesus said was, Take care of my, my kids. Take care of my people. Take care of my sheep. Shepherd them. So get back in the game. S stop sucking your thumb in a corner with your blankie. <laughs> You're such a baby. I am not. You're a poopy head. You know. <laughs> Cut it out, Peter. Get out of the corner and get back in. Get, you're on the team. You, you didn't lose anything. You, you lost some intimacy there and some credibility. That'll take a little while to build back up, but you're still on the team. And Jesus loves him. Jesus loves him. And he has to restore him three times, probably because Peter's conscience needed that. How many of you have trouble accepting God's forgiveness? Oh, good. I'm not the only one. You know, I have to beat myself severely before I forgive myself. <laughs> it's not a good practice. Because I'm not worthy, because I have a self-interest, don't I? And I was the one who sinned. So I really don't have the credentials to be able to pay off my own sin, and neither do you. Only Jesus does. And aren't you glad for that? Amen. That's why he came, to be our great shepherd. And Peter is given this wonderful mandate to feed and to tend the flock of God. And so he's a great example for us. I don't, I don't think he was the first pope. I, he certainly was married. Mm -hmm. So there's a problem with that whole thing. But anyway, <laughs> what do I know? In Psalm 23, you'll, you'll remember this is the Psalm of David. Now, David was a shepherd, so he knew something about being a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, I shall not have a lack of any good thing that I need. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his Name's sake. In other words, he shows me the right things to do, not, not necessarily uh, for anything other than because it's right for him. And he's the one who sees the big plan. Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's, that's easy to say. It's harder to do, isn't it? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, those are the instruments of a shepherd, they comfort me. By the way, the rod is for punishment. The staff is for deliverance. 
And so, Lord, I accept your deliverance, your gifts, your grace, but also your chastisement. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, you give me a safe place to be, even though everything around me is falling apart. You anoint my head with oil. Um, anointing your head with oil, oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. And you know what, you know what these male sheep do? They, they actually jam into each other with their skulls. Have you seen this? <laughs> and they get all messed up in their head. And so he anoints their head with, you know what that does? That makes you slip off <laughs> instead of cracking. And so the Holy Spirit is that which eliminates the friction that otherwise could be. Oh, you like that? The word of God is full of things like this. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. In other words, you give me more than enough. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because I'm worthy of it? No, but because I have a good shepherd. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, because it's not based upon your perfection. It's based upon his. And he made a commitment to us when we made a commitment to him and we fall down a hundred times. He never will. Amen. So shepherding as an overseer means serving the sheep. That's what it means. So it's not like, uh, you know, you should get yourself a nice easy chair and put your feet up. So that's me or any one of the other elders here. We're under shepherds. We're not, we're not the shepherd, but we are shepherds. And so that's our job to be kind of like a sheepdog and under the direction of the shepherd to make sure that the sheep are going in the right direction and doing those things that need to be done. And sometimes there's some really difficult work that has to be done, but praise God, the Lord has raised up three other men besides myself to be faithful to this calling. So I just thought I'd mention that to you. And this is what not to do, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So there's a special promise for those who serve in this capacity, not under compulsion, um, nobody's got a bullet, you know, with your name on it and point it at your head saying, you got to do this. You know what it's like when you have to go to work and it's Monday morning and you go, oh, I got to go to work. <laughs> have you ever had that Monday morning? <laughs> I can't believe it's Monday already. I don't feel that extra hour of sleep. <laughs> That's feeling compulsion. Okay. I got to go because I got to pay my bills and my mortgage is high and oh my goodness, the taxes and I got to go. You drag yourself out of bed <laughs> and you go into the shower. You see, it says, don't do that. If you're an elder, don't do your job like that. You know, somebody comes up to you and says, oh, Pastor Dave, can I talk to you for a minute? You go, what? <laughs> what? Do you see I'm busy? Do you see I have things to do? I have places to go, people to see. You have no idea. And if I've ever done that to you, I'm really sorry. Or the other elders willingly. It's like, you want to talk to me? Yeah, you got a minute? Oh, I got a minute. Oh, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. And I'm, you know, I need to genuflex and, you know, like, you don't have to do all that. When somebody has a right heart and they're serving the Lord, it doesn't matter what it is that you think you're doing. You're not. And people say this to me all the time. I'm sorry to keep you so long. Do you think there's invisible chains on me that you possess? I don't have a free will. And I understand people are being nice, but you don't have to be nice like that. Being, being an elder, being an older, being someone who is guiding and directing the body of Christ, it's, it is a pleasure. Listen, I, could, I have done many other worse jobs than this. Trust me. I've had a worse crowd than this. It's okay. Don't do it under compulsion. If you're an elder, don't do it because I got to do this. I got to go to church. You know, you heard about the guy, his wife's waking up, say, you got to wake up. You got to go to church. Yeah, but I don't want to go there. Yeah, but you got to go. It's Sunday morning. And those people don't like me. They say, it doesn't matter. You really need to go. Yeah, but I, you have to be there. You're the pastor. 
that's not the way to be a pastor. The way to be a pastor is that you give your life, you, there has to be a calling, there has to be a giftedness that comes, and there has to be a lot of perspiration in between there so that you can do your job. And so we don't do it by compulsion, we do it willingly. And who in the world wants somebody, you know, like if you ask somebody, hey, could you do me a favor? And they go, what? <laughs> who wants to, it, you never mind. No, 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 tell me. Who in the world wants to even ask you ever again to do anything, right? I don't know about you, but I hate to ask anybody for anything. But if I suddenly ask somebody for something, it's got to be pretty serious. And if I get that kind of reaction, I say, oh, I'm sorry, never mind. I'll ask somebody else who's willing. And they're like, ooh, what do you got? What's happening? You know who's like that? Joe DeJesus. Joe DeJesus would do anything I tell him, I think. What a good brother. He comes in early. He leaves late. Whatever we do, we do unto the Lord. Amen. We serve him first, whether it's a job or whether it's ministry. And sometimes it's hard to tell what is what. Not for dishonest gain. Boy, that kicks a lot of TV preachers off of the, off of the podium, doesn't it? Not for dishonest gain. I mean, I know of a church that they had an offering and um, the pastor's wife went back behind the curtain and counted it and came out and whispered to the pastor, there's not enough money. And they had a second offering and they extracted it from people and they watched while the plate went around. The pastor's wife went back behind the curtain and counted the money. This is a real thing that really happened in a church near here. There's still not enough money. Okay, we're going to try one more time. We're going to take another offering. Like, so you're not going to preach until they pay you enough money. You're not in it for the right reasons. And there are people that will plead with you on TV. Oh, send a, just send us a hundred dollar bill. And yeah, I don't know. They all seem to have Southern accents, but, <laughs> and God will bless you a thousand times. And they're trying to extract money out of you. I, I, I feel it. When, uh, extortion, I get it. I, I know how to do it. I've seen people do it. I, I'm pretty adept to it, and I tend to be real sensitive to it. You would think that God really has a problem taking care of his kids. That, like, you're going to get to heaven, and it's going to be like, hey, I'm sorry, we just went bankrupt. Um, <laughs> heaven isn't going to go bankrupt. And wherever God guides, he's going to provide. This is a great example. I never tell you people about anything about money. And you guys willingly give unto the Lord as it should be. And we got money in the bank. We pay our bills. Everything's fine. Nobody sweats it. I wish things were that good at home. <laughs> but I think he creates those scenarios so we learn to depend on him. And we rest in him and not upon our own fiscal abilities. So anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. And it's a communion Sunday. So we're running out of time. Eager, eager. You serve because you're eager. You, 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 you know what eager, eager is, right? Eager is I'm excited. I'm pumped. You know, Pastor Dave, I got a problem. Awesome. <laughs> what do you got? You go up to Car Carl. Hey, Carl, I got a problem. He goes, all right. It's like you just called a football player off the bench. You, get in the game. Okay, coach, I'm on it. You know, you put the hat on and away you go. Eager. That's the way it's supposed to be. Not under compulsion. Not for dishonest gain. Not lording it over them. But serving the flock of God. Not, you know, there are people that have ego issues who need to have people under them that they can boss around or they feel like nothing. They have to make $280,000 a year or they don't feel like something. Isn't that sad? That, that sort of need for power tells me that their vertical relationship with God is not as it should be because we're all servants. Jesus showed us by washing feet, the feet of his disciples. I mean, any 12 of you have cleaner feet than any one of them. <laughs> Not like a king in his court, but not lording it over those entrusted to you, 
but being examples to the flock. You know, it's very easy to tell people what to do. It's another thing to show people what to do. I could tell you all day long what the Bible says. It doesn't mean I do it. But the Bible says I need to do it. 2 Timothy 2.6 says, the hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops, which means I've got to open the word of God and it has to be mine. I have to have an, a relationship with God first. And then I have something to give you. It's not, I'm so busy taking care of you and I'm, give, I'm pouring out of an empty cup. You know what that feels like? You ever go to somebody and say, listen, I, I need your advice. There's this thing going on, and I was just wondering what you would do in this situation. You go, huh, sucks to be you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, pray about it. Have you tried that? All right, well, I don't know. Why don't you go ask Carl? Being an example to the flock means that God puts you through a lot of stuff so that you can hand that baton off to someone else. What a blessing that is. Uh, don't try to pretend you've never been through anything because it suddenly disqualifies you. Anyway, and there is a benefit to this and you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So the promise is given that the rewards aren't here and now, the rewards are later. You know, when I, when I see the Lord, I would love to hear those words, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. And that's all I want to hear. If we remember that here and now, it certainly helps us when we don't get what we think we deserve or what we've earned here and now. And that goes for everybody, not just elders, right? Amen. Amen. In Luke 22, 24 to 26, Jesus explains to us, the, Dr. Luke writing here about when Jesus was walking the earth. Now there was a dispute among them, the disciples, as to which one of them should be considered the greatest. Jesus was always mediating arguments that they had with each other. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. In other words, they're making a profit off of you. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. Jesus says in another place, if you want to become great, you have to be the servant of everyone. Wouldn't that be good if our new president would do that? This is great leadership advice. Wouldn't it be good if they served the people instead of their own devices, their own party, their own ego? And so it is in the church. And so it is wherever it is that you go. If you're in the business of helping other people, that means that you're in the business of being filled up by the Lord to be able to pour into other people. Or you go, huh, that's a bad situation you got there. Let me know how that turns out, you know. Verse 5, likewise, you younger people, you thought you'd get away with something, you younger people, right? He's talking to the elders, now he's talking to the youngers. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves and by the way, if you don't humble yourself, God will. Amen. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So young people, he understands that it might be difficult for you to submit <laughs> to your elders. And so you need some help and cast your cares on him in the midst of all of that. So youngers, listen to your elders. Um, I, I think of Norman Rockwell when I, uh, when I think about that passage. Uh, here's a little boy who's running away from home. You can tell because he's got the, the traditional over-the-shoulder hobo bag packed. And he goes to the diner and he, he apparently going to have his last meal because, you know, he, he doesn't have pockets full of cash. And he runs into a police officer. And the police officer's having a conversation with him. 
I just think that's a, a really great picture, a little uh, picture of Americana there. But submitting is not something that anybody likes to do. And yet we all have to do. In fact, the passage says that we should all submit to one another. Now, that doesn't mean if a police officer is trying to pull you over, you go, no, you got to submit to me too. I mean, you're my employee. <laughs> Hang on a minute. There's an order here and we need to observe that. But why don't we have a heart where we're willing to serve one another, where we're willing to take a lower place or somebody drops their fork while we're eating today and you feel like, well, it's not my fork. I'm not picking that up. So you're going to watch some octogenarian try to bend and contort their body underneath the table to go pick up the fork they dropped. That's shameful. Anyway, sorry. I had a mental picture in my mind and I got lost for a moment. Younger people, submit yourselves. And it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, Ephesians 5.21. So it's not just this one passage. It's actually throughout the scripture. You serve one another. If everyone came together and said, how can I serve you? Boy, what a church that would be, huh? Amen. How can I help you? How can I pray for you? What, what are your needs? Boy, you'd get to know somebody real quick, wouldn't you? There would be a, a bond of trust that would begin to be built there. And relationships, that's how relationships are built, by intimacy. Matthew 20, 16 says, so the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. It's one of those mysterious passages I wish I understood the full depth of. But we're to be submissive to one another. There isn't like, you know, there, oh, well, yeah, Carl can't do that. He's an elder. Well, Carl can reach all the high things. <laughs> so there are things that only Carl can do. Can you get the toilet paper down? Oh, sure. <laughs> That's what he does. Sure, I'll get that for you. Submission looks like Jesus as much as leadership does. Amen. Submission looks, smells like, feels like Jesus as much as leadership does. Amen. And I think that's the point. So verse eight, be sober. It, it's, it, it's not what you think it means. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, <laughs> perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. This is the set next section where it's to be watchful. We are exhorted by the Lord through the scriptures to be watchful. So we'll take a look at that. Be sober. It, it's, it doesn't mean that you can't have VIX 44. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a glass of wine at dinner. Although that might be a good choice uh, for many people. It means to be sober, level-headed, reasonable, not uh, taken away by your emotions. Be sober is to be calm, collected, in spirit, to be temp temperate, dispassionate, which means non-reactive. Do you know what I'm talking about? Amen. Like somebody says, hey, can you do me a favor? What? <laughs> it's not very sober of you. <laughs> the reaction doesn't quite match what I've just said. Any of you ever do that? Respond like... Whoosh, None of you. That's great. Man, I, you could teach me a few things. Dispassionate, which means you don't react emotionally. Circumspect, which means you're very careful. You're careful about what you say. You're careful about what you do. You're careful about where you go. You're careful about your friends. You're careful. Circumspect. And there are all of these other scriptures that say the very same thing. Be vigilant. It means to watch, to give strict attention to, to be cautious, and to be active. Oh, come on. You're too serious, man. Lighten up. No, you, you don't lighten up. It means that you're going to be careful about what you watch. And there are a bunch of other scriptures that talk about that, too. As you can see, I'm just trying to, trying to get to the end. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Do you believe that? 
Do you believe that we have an adversary who's running around on this earth who's looking to devour you? Matthew 6.13, and this is the Lord's Prayer, by the way, as it's written. Matthew 6.13, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He didn't say deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. Isn't that curious? How many of you are just seeing this now for the first time? Yeah, because you memorized it in another version, right? This is actually what is written, and you'll see it again here in Luke. And forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You see, we're not praying that God doesn't give us any hard times, or, but that he doesn't, that he protects us from the evil one. Because we have an adversary who is roaming around like a ravenous lion, seeking whom he may devour. And you don't want to be a target, Right? So that's what we pray. Now, some people, they go through this sort of, you know, some people aren't really circumspect. They go to the other extreme where they're looking for the devil under every rock. Like, oh, that, you know, Satan's in that chair. I can't sit in that chair. You know, Satan's on the lawn. I can't be on the lawn. Satan's in my car. Satan, by the way, Satan only inhabits flesh. I just thought I'd let you know that, according to the scripture. The demons, when they cried out to Jesus, they said, let us go into the pigs. And they went into the pigs. They don't go into trees. They don't go into your furniture. They're not. All of that's a lot of superstition. So don't be an Elmer Fudd looking for the devil under every seat cushion because it's not happening. But we do have an enemy. And I'll tell you, the biggest battle is right here. So what we do is we respect him because he's dangerous but he doesn't read my mind and he doesn't control me any longer because I belong to someone else recognize him because he is devious resist him because he seeks your life that's what we're told to do with him now if more of my conversation is about the devil and less of it's about Jesus guess who's getting the glory Oh, the devil this and the devil, ooh, ooh, and it, oh, oh, evil, evil everywhere. Guess what? He's going, awesome, man. I am so famous in this person's eyes. Respect him. Watch out. Be on your guard. Don't give him any glory. The, water, the, the battle has already been won by Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. You're saved. As far as the scripture is concerned in Ephesians, you're already seated there. It's a done deal. James 4, 7 to 10 says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Oh, so if you tell him no, you might have to tell him more, no more than once. But then what happens? He goes, that's it. I'm going somewhere else. Don't you want him to go somewhere else? Yeah. I absolutely do. I, I have a place that the Lord has allocated for him. That's where I'd like him to go. And he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So getting right with God means that you're going to have to resist the devil. There is a part that we play in resisting the devil, and we're told to do that. If you don't, and you just kick back and say, ah, God's not going to get the glory he otherwise could have if we were fully submissive and we were obedient. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want to do. He's going into the hopeful section, and I'm going to complete with this. It says, resist him steadfast in the faith. By the way, it is the faith. There's only one. There's not your faith. There's my faith. There's her faith. There's his faith. It's the faith, by the way. You know, kick up your faith, man. Where's your The faith. You resist him in the faith. You guys noticing that? Amen. Because there are TV preachers that will say all other things. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So I'm supposed to resist the devil because I know everybody else has a problem with him too. How's that help me? 
Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you cannot stand before Satan until you've bowed before God. You cannot stand up against temptation and against the devil himself unless you have bowed your knee to God first. That's the first place. Amen? Amen. So why is it that everyone else is doing this? We're not alone, by the way, because we're all going through this. It's not just you. In fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man or mankind. But God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but along with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. Which means you and I are going through the same stuff. So when I resist the devil and I resist the devil, uh, maybe you've been through the same struggle that I've been through. Maybe we should have a conversation about that. Hey, what did you do when you struggled with your in-laws? What did you do when your boss told you to do something immoral? What happened when you were struggling with pornography? How did you handle that marital issue? How did you finally get a handle on your finances? You know, there's a lot of wisdom in this room that God has given to people by bringing them through things. And you would be wise to avail yourself of some of that. Amen? Amen. And so I'm going to be encouraged to resist him because you know what? Everyone else is going through stuff and it's going to cause me to ask for counsel too, by the way, along with prayer. But may the God of grace who called to his eternal glory, Jesus Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I'm going to leave that for next week. What God does through these trials, all the difficulties that happen, and how he works in us, that which is pleasing to him. You know what they call a child who has never had any difficulty? Spoiled. Boy, you guys know that. <laughs> Yeah. When we go through these things, God creates in us his character. And so we're told to embrace these things, these hardships that are going on. And Peter is writing to people who are really, really suffering. They're undergoing a lot of persecution to the point where they're losing their lives for naming their lives with Jesus. We've got it easy. But right now in this place, God can build this up and get us ready for what's going to happen. So that whatever's going to happen, I can go through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil because you are with me. Amen. Amen. Amen.